<laughs> Could you do that again, Sam? <laughs> well, I decided I better plug in my like get my cord ready if I need to charge my phone. Like I, I, I think I have plenty of juice, but then I started to have a little panic. <laughs> yeah. preparing the live streaming preview. Smile, Phil. Are we on? Not quite yet. It is fetching video stream. It could take a few seconds, it says. We are now live streaming. Good evening. My name is Field Horn. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the Saratoga County History Center. <clears throat> this is one in our series of programs of the Experts Next Door, in which we connect the community with experts, chiefly in the area of history, but not necessarily. Uh, briefly, I'd like everyone to know that the Saratoga History Center, Saratoga County History Center, is a new version of the 50-year-old Saratoga County Historical Society. We are seeking to build a dynamic resource for celebrating Saratoga County's exciting past and charting its promising future. These programs are one aspect of that goal. This program is underwritten by Strader and Company, a premier Burnt Hills based construction firm with a specialization in restoration and renovation. Our four speakers tonight are Samantha Bossart, Executive Director of the Saratoga Springs Preservation Foundation, Teddy Foster, Executive Director of the Universal Preservation Hall, Carrie Werner, Assemblywoman from the 113th New York Assembly District, and John Shearer, official historian of the town of Clifton Park. I'll introduce each in turn as we come to them on the floor. First, Samantha Bossart, who will introduce us to the pioneering work going back as far as 1965 
in historic preservation in the city of Saratoga Springs. She has nearly 25 years experience in this field, having worked at the Galveston Historical Foundation, Historic Albany Foundation, as well as her present role, where she's been executive director for 12 years. She holds a BA in history from Indiana University and completed her coursework for an MA in historic preservation planning at Cornell. She serves on the board of directors of Discover Saratoga, Adirondack Architectural Heritage, and National Preservation Partners Network. Samantha. Thank you, Phil. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm gonna just kind of give a, a brief overview of, of as, which will be hard to do because Saratoga has had such a long history in the, and preservation, um, but it will hopefully inform people about the different tools and aspects of preservation that have helped to make Saratoga so successful. So for over 40 years, the Saratoga Springs um, Preservation Foundation has been working diligently to preserve and enhance the, the architectural and cultural heritage of Saratoga Springs. However, we were not um, the first um, to start the movement. We sort of came after some earlier movements in our community. Historic preservation is a key to revitalization and economic success, not only for Saratoga Springs, but for many cities across the country. And Saratoga has not always looked like as people think of it as today, uh, the vibrant, thriving downtown with beautiful residential neighborhoods. It was at one point a thriving resort destination in the late 1800s. However, by the 1950s and 60s and 70s, Saratoga saw a decline and it was no longer a destination. While we had the track and by the late 1960s, we had um, SPAC, we were not attracting residents, businesses, or um, people to come and live here or people to visit. Uh, it was a much different city than what we see now. In 1973, it's hard to imagine, we had 22 vacant storefronts, and many of those buildings did not look like they did today. Many of the large mansions that you see on North Broadway have been subdivided into apartments. They had um, also been, their carriage houses had been subdivided from the property. People couldn't maintain these large homes, as well as um, the grand hotels that were once part of our identity were already lost. And so really Saratoga was faced with a lot of different things in the late 1960s, or well, 1950s and 1960s and into the 1970s. We were faced with things such as uh, two proposals to build a convention center of some sort in Congress Park. Uh, that would have been irreversible irreplaceably changed the, the, our, one of our big, biggest assets. Uh, then also we had um, a threat of an arterial to go through our oldest residential historic district that would have bypassed our downtown. And you can see the remains of that arterial when you look at Route 50 behind back and the parking and how that would have connected bypassing Broadway all the way to the Route 50 that goes to Wilton and how devastating that could have been. But it was early efforts of people like B. Sweeney and, um, uh, and um, oh gosh, now I'm drawing a blank, uh, Evelyn Field, <laughs> um, Evelyn, why can I not think of her name? Brit Britain. Britain. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's embarrassing. Uh, our city historian at the time that really, you know, took up the cause to prevent the development of Congress Park, but also to protect our residential areas. And they, they did so by advocating for our history. And in fact, at one point there, when there was the 150 room proposal in Congress Park, uh, Ada Louise Huxtable wrote, uh, she was a prominent architectural historian wrote, the latest beautification and preservation bulletin comes from Saratoga, a community known for its historic Victorian heritage and its new cultural center. It is not news to make anyone easy about the cultural state of Saratoga or the nation. It follows a pattern of aesthetic and environmental erosion. 
And it really just raised the bar about what we needed to do. And that was also right around the time of the National Preservation Act. And B and others took, took note and they used that tool and designated historic districts on the National Register of Historic Places, which not only is largely honorary, but it can provide a measure of mitigation or protection for projects that are funded through state or federal dollars. And that proved really important for us later uh, with such as Union Avenue Historic District when we wanted to, when we there was a need for tax credits to rehab the buildings that were left from when Skidmore vacated their historic buildings, nearly 90 historic buildings on Union Avenue in our downtown to move to the North Broadway campus. It also um, helped to generate grant funding. So there were all these important pieces that sort of led to um, the foundation being founded. And that was in 1977, but, but we were really an outgrowth of Saratoga Plan for Action, in which case the business and community leaders came together and realized that to, preserve, to revitalize their downtown, it, there needed to be different facets of the community. And that included beautifying Broadway, planting trees, park benches, providing parking. But one of the other key pieces was, was revitalizing and rehabilitating the downtown building. And they realized that also that uh, there was going to be a facade grant program, and that facade grant program should be overseen not by the business community or by the municipality, but through an independent organization that could be the voice for those buildings. And so that is where the foundation started. And we were actually established with funding from the city. They recognized the value of preservation so much that they were willing to invest public dollars into our organization to continue the work that we started or that, that we needed to do. And a direct result of that was 25 facade easements that re rehabilitated and restored the, um, buildings downtown. And you can see that today. And those, there were a lot of insensitive alterations to downtown. And this facade grant program played a critical role in that investment, but not only in their appearance, but bringing them up to code. So there, that was one piece of the, there's so many pieces in this toolbox of preservation. And, and a lot of it's grant funding, it's tax credits, it's advoc advocating for um, our buildings, for example, our organization was started in 1977 in April, and one of the first causes that they had to champion was what is now Universal Preservation Hall. Uh, the building was threatened with demolition, and uh, it, Julie Stokes found a $100 grant to get a structural engineer's report to, um, in, to say that the building could be preserved and restored. And with that, um, the city and the invested in that church, in fact, the city through a mechanism that I'm not gonna have the exact name for, but essentially the city invested and paid for the repairs of that building and the church repaid the city back over a period of time. And it's hard to imagine that what would have happened if that building hadn't been preserved in 1977, or again in 1999 when the same thing happened again and the foundation did initial steps to step in, but I'm gonna let Teddy talk more about that. But th that's advocating, that's getting people to raise awareness and be a part of saving our history because ultimately, if we don't preserve our buildings or our, our historic resources, what are what do we how do we distinguish ourselves from other communities and i think every his community has a history and their buildings tell that history and it's really important that we advocate for that but we also fundraise for that and so the foundation has also been in, in addition to fundraising for early projects like universal well with universal baptist church at that time but the Spirit of Life and Spencer Trask Memorial, or today, most recently, the First Baptist Church, we're helping them restore their stained glass windows. These landmark buildings tell our stories, and it's really important. But one of the biggest important pieces of our um, tools in the toolbox is the local historic review ordinance, which uh, oversees exterior changes, demolition, and new construction. And in essence, that's uh, a volunteer 
mayor appointed review board that reviews those changes and makes those decisions based on historic guidelines that are based on the national, um, the, oh gosh, that's embarrassing. The president, <laughs> secretary of interior standards. Oh my goodness. And, um, and with that, we ensure that hopefully we try that buildings of importance are not lost, but also that new construction that's just built is in keeping or in context or complements our historic resources. And it's all part of the puzzle of preservation and what it means to be in a district or part of part of um, the review process. I mean, Saratoga would not look like it does today if it weren't for the local review ordinance or these uh, designated National Register Historic Districts. And the not only has tax credits for like such buildings as Universal Preservation Hall or the Adelphi or the Algonquin, but even smaller buildings with the New York State Homeowner Tax Credit have played an important role here as well. And and um, we we realize that the economic value, we've always touted the economic benefits bits of historic preservation here at the foundation. However, we never had the quantified information. And so in late 2018, we undertook an economic impact study with Donovan Ripkema, who is nationally recognized economist, um, to do an impact study on the historic, uh, historic preservation in Saratoga Springs. And there's just a few things that I'd like to share that we, um, based on looking at 20 years of data, MLS data and other information, uh, what, what economic benefits that preservation has provided our community. Houses in local districts, regardless of age, size, style, or condition are more valuable per square foot and increase value more rapidly comparable to other properties not located in historic districts despite having additional oversight. And in fact, they return, retain their value at a better rate during times that are uh, challenging, such as the recession in 2008. Land values in local historic districts contribute 14% of the total assessed value of the city despite only being 6% of the land area, providing an uh, important source of income for the city of Saratoga Springs, Saratoga County, and the local school district. And then housing options in local historic districts are more diverse, providing 19% of all rental units and 51% of units in historic districts rent for less than $1,000 per month. So it, see, you would almost think that that would not be the case, but it is. And lastly, local historic districts attract 31% of small firms and 46% of young firms. And so this, this all contributes to the economic vitality of our city. And um, so I just think there's lots of tools in the toolbox to think about. It's, it's national being designated on the national, national and state historic districts. It's being a certified local government that provides funding opportunities for the city to, to undertake surveys, uh, develop design guidelines. It helped to underwrite a portion of this economic impact study that you can review on our website uh, that, and as actually was mentioned in uh, another recent publication, 24 Reasons That Historic Preservation is Good for Communities. And um, it's been recognized nationally and internationally. So preservate and then um, grants and tax credits. So there's all these different pieces that are toolbox in the toolbox that could help lots of other communities in, in Saratoga County that have a rich heritage. And I'm gonna turn it over to Field, but that's just sort of a quick overview of more than 50, well, gosh, almost 60 years, 70 years of preservation in our community. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Samantha. <clears throat> Following up on what uh, Samantha has told us, uh, our next speaker is Teddy Foster. Teddy had a successful professional career before coming fairly late to historic preservation and making quite a splash. She joined the board of Universal Preservation Hall in 2006, became its president three years later, and five years ago uh, went on staff. She now runs a fully functioning, beautifully restored public space in downtown Saratoga Springs. Teddy? 
Uh, thank you, Phil. Uh, yeah, we'd like to call UPH our beautiful old gal because uh, she really, really is. Um, yeah, I came on the scene in 2006, not as a preservationist. I was an ignorant preservationist, but I came on as a volunteer wanting to help because here was this beautiful old building with these spectacular stained glass windows and such good bones to it because uh, the earlier group had stabilized it so well and they really needed help to get to the next level. So um, I got involved and I can tell you, I quickly uh, stopped thinking about the people that were involved and it became all about the building uh, for me because this building is so special to Saratoga, it truly de deserves its place in our history as well as in our future. Um, it was really interesting, our timing. Uh, so I came on 2006, and in 2009, the recession hit the country. So the project was going along quite well until then, and then the recession hit. And um, it was devastating to UPH at that point in time. It stopped our momentum dead in its tracks. Um, we had board members who, uh, couldn't pay any attention to the, the, the building because they had to save their own businesses. Um, I was laid off from my job, I had no job. You know, everything just kind of uh, came to a, a halt. So then um, for us and the remaining board members, it really became about uh, keeping the building alive, keeping the building from deteriorating again, and trying to figure out a way to make it go forward. And um, I will tell you that we limped along for a few years, just doing anything and everything to get people in there. You may or may not know, uh, when the original group of people involved salvage and stabilize this building, it was really a seasonal venue because we didn't have heat all on both floors. We only had heat on the first floor, and which meant through the winter months, the colder months, we couldn't use the Great Hall upstairs. So it was, it was interesting. Anything we did had to be, do, do, be done downstairs. We also weren't handicap accessible because we had no elevator. So um, we just tried to be really creative and work with people to try to help them make things happen to keep it limping along. I also uh, want to mention now, uh, what wonderful board members I did have at that time. Um, they were very generous with their time and their talent. It really helped us keep going. They found people who came in and want, were interested in historic preservation to see it and uh, got us through about three really tough years. In 2012, um, I can remember sitting with Wally Allardyce who was really instrumental in helping me maintain this building. And um, I said to Wally, we're done. I said, I don't, I, I don't know what else to do to keep this building, building open. And I've got I've to get some advice from somebody. And so he said, well, who are you going to call? And I said, well, I'm going to call this guy named Philip Morris from Proctor's because I've heard about him. And I'm just going to call him and ask him for some advice. And uh, uh, Wally said, well, as a matter of fact, one of my best friends is president of the board. So Wally and I both called together. Uh, we got um, his friend who was Tony Mashuda. His name was on, on the phone. He set up a call with Philip Morris. I talked to Philip Morris and invited him up to see our building. I just asked for advice. What can you do to help me? Give me some ideas that I can keep this thing going. And uh, uh, the Proctor's team came up the following week. This was in 2012. And uh, they spent five hours in the building, fell in love with the building. And then they told me that they were moving forward on becoming a regional entity and that they loved our building and they would like to affiliate with us. So it was, um, it was a really important step in our process of um, getting the restoration of UPH done and, and brought to fruition. 
So we headed down the path that we were going to affiliate with Proctor's and it was a really good thing to do because I, was, I wasn't even an employee. We only had a part-time office manager and nobody had the expertise to make this happen. And what the partnering with uh, Proctor's brought to us was expertise in uh, historic uh, preservation, design, historic tax credits, financing, fundraising, programming, ticketing, um, marketing. I can go on and on and on. They just brought a cornucopia of skills to me that I could use with their help to uh, raise the money to get this building done. So we started off on the yellow brick road to get that done and then up another obstacle happened. The whole casino issue came up uh, in the state and uh, Governor Cuomo was gonna put four casinos um, in, in the state. And so we had to wait and see how that all resolved itself because had there been a, a big enough casino put in Saratoga that would have It looks well, like we lost Teddy um, due to internet issues. Um, it looks like she froze. So while we wait for her to come back, I forgot one thing that I wanted to say was that um, I think historic preservation has served us well, especially during COVID, because while um, we people are still coming here and it's we're not with the track and it's not with SPAC. It's because our downtown is a destination and our out, you know, so I think there's there people often associate that the success of Saratoga is solely on that, but I think we are seeing that we're able to make do with in part being a destination because of the way we because of our historic downtown and neighborhood. So I thought I'd share that little nugget. So we get back to <laughs> Teddy. Teddy's screen is missing entirely, so we can come back to her. But let me introduce Carrie Werner now. Uh, Carrie is, as I said, the Assemblywoman from the 113th District. She has a background in historic preservation, having volunteered in the Boston area and served for, as executive director of the Preservation Foundation from 2002 to 2008. She is active on a state level in advancing preservation and she'll discuss state and federal tax credits and plans for further improvements to them. Carrie? Thank you so much, Field, uh, and hello, everybody. It's nice to be with you this evening. Um, I thought I would start, and I'm going to just echo some of the points that Sa uh, Samantha made early on, and that's that, you know, when we th think about preservation and and um, and for communities or groups and communities that are pondering the question, should we should we make a push to um, establish a preservation initiative, a preservation organization? Should we, should we list, um, should we try and get districts identified? I would just say that the arguments are, um, it creates a unique sense of place. Um, when, you, when you come into a historic um, downtown, whether that's downtown Saratoga Springs or Schuylerville or Mechanicville, or any of the other small towns that we have around here, when you're in the center of Galway, when you're in the center of Charlton, they have a unique sense of place. Um, the buildings that are there have been there for um, decades, sometimes centuries. Um, they are, uh, they tell a story all on their own. There's also plenty of research that says that creative economy workers um, prefer authentic spaces and the, and the economic study that the Preservation Foundation 
uh, did two years ago really bears this out that that young people who are working in software companies or design companies, they prefer to be in authentic places. It gives them a sense of creativity. Um, and then the last piece is that, um, as Sam was pointing out, that people come to historic places just to be in historic places. And, and what we know is that that heritage tourists, people who travel to see historic sites, spend twice as uh, spend three times as much money and stay twice as long as regular recreational tourists. Um, so, as an economic development tool in some of our smaller communities, it is a it's an important aspect to this. Um, a lot of times when we talk about heritage tourism, we're talking about historic sites. And certainly our county in Saratoga County has a lot of historic sites. Some of them are um, house museums like, um, like the Park Spentley House in South Glens Falls or um, other museums like the Brookside Museum. Um, or it could be the Auto Museum, which is a state historic property that, ha that is run as an auto museum. Um, and just this last month, we have um, a finalized investment in building out a historic site at the Susan B. Anthony House in Greenwich. Um, so these can be locally designated, state designated, or federally designated um, destinations. But certainly that's not the only, um, the only reason that people um, who are heritage tourists come to a region. They come because it has that authentic space. It has, um, it has buildings which tell a story, neighborhoods which tell a story. Um, and so those are the, those are the national state um, registers of historic places, the, the districts. Sometimes they're individual buildings, um, but more often they're, they're districts. The, it, this is largely an honorific designation. It is done through the State Historic Preservation Office, which is a, um, a unit within um, the state's uh, um, Office of Parks and Recreation. Um, and they evaluate the, the district for its um, historic theme, uh, for its amount of intact buildings, uh, for, the, for the, the historic significance of the district. It doesn't constrain, and one of the things people are almost always afraid of is, I don't wanna be in a district because it's gonna constrain what I can do on my property. And it doesn't. Just being listed in a national register district doesn't do anything other than uh, acknowledge that this is a, a district that has um, a, a, a intact history um, and the buildings are part of it. Um, and more than that, it makes the buildings eligible for um, tax credits. And I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, there are certainly um, standards for rehabilitation that the um, Secretary of the Interior has um, and those um, uh, if, you, if you use the tax credits or if you are in a locally designated historic district, um, those standards for rehabilitation are things that um, the, the, um, the, the local government will expect you to follow in, in rehabbing your building. But um, generally speaking, um, it does not, it doesn't, it certainly doesn't constrain your paint colors. Um, it's a, it is honorific and it opens up for you the opportunity um, to use the tax credits, which are the state's principal tool for encouraging um, the preservation of historic places and, and historic um, neighborhoods and downtowns. There's both a federal um, tax credit and a state tax credit. Um, and, and should you wonder whether, whether these are meaningful, um, one of the things that I would, I would just I, I try to point out to people is that um, neighborhoods like the, in Saratoga Springs, the Franklin Square neighborhood, um, were almost all of those buildings were done with the federal tax credits back in the 70s. Um, and a young developer, um, Bob Israel, would never have been able to do what he did if he had not have, uh, had access to those tax credits. Um, so they are really a meaningful amount, a, a meaningful tool. Um, the federal tax credit is a 20% tax credit. Um, uh, and we're talking about commercial properties here. So income producing properties, which could be um, residential rentals or it could be a, co um, a commercial building. Um, it's a 20% credit on all of your qualifying expenses. Um, the federal credit has no cap on it. So um, as Samantha pointed out, the, the Adelphi just recently used the tax credits and that was, a, um, that was I think a $17 million project. Is that right, Sam? It was a big project. 30, 34 million. That was a $34 million project um, and they got 20% um, of that back in 
uh, a tax credit from the federal government. Um, there is a, there's a, a comparable state credit, which is also a 20% credit. Um, um, that, however, is capped at a um, uh, maximum of $50,000 on the, on the credit. Um, there's a residential tax credit, which a lot of people um, are not aware of. Most people think about the tax credits as these big projects um, and, and commercial. But there is also a, um, a residential credit at the state level for, um, uh, for pro just, you know, for you and me. And you have to spend a minimum of uh, $5,000 in qualified expenses. Um, and it's a, it too is a 20%, um, it's, it's a 20 percent credit. Now, there's no such thing as free money in anything. We all know that. Um, so you do have to have the project approved ahead of time. Um, and they're going to look at what your plans are, what your building is, what your plans are, um, the degree to which you are following this, the, uh, the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Um, and it is a person at the State Historic Preservation Office that will do this, um, this approval. Um, the state credits have to be used in what's called a, a qualified uh, census track. Um, and it, so it is targeted at underinvested communities. Um, Saratoga Springs has fewer and fewer and fewer of these um, census tracts remaining, um, but other communities in Saratoga County still have quite a few of them remaining. Um, so you can, uh, there's communities like Schuylerville, communities like um, uh, Mechanicville, Stillwater, um, that still fall within these qualified census tracts. Um, we, in the, last, uh, in the last year, we've tried to expand the qualified census tracts so that more and more neighborhoods um, uh, can, be, can be included in that, and we'll continue to try and do that. We're also working on, um, uh, I have a bill to try to um, create a small projects credit. Um, so there's work involved in applying for tax credits. Um, it is, uh, and so you often find that it's the larger projects that, that do this because they've got somebody who knows how to do tax credits and all the paperwork and everything. Um, so we're working on, on trying to create a small projects credit um, to, to help the, you know, the, the, uh, um, the building owner who has maybe a four unit commercial um, uh, apartment building who needs to uh, repoint the front of their building or replace the windows or wants to do redo the entranceway um, that those that small project would be um, eligible for the tax credits as well um, so I think I'll I think I'll stop there because those are the that's sort of the highlights of the state programs and um, uh, and certainly happy to answer questions later on thank you Carrie we lost Teddy Foster uh, for, through technical problems, and she is back with us. Teddy, would you like to continue and, and close out eventually, please? Yeah, thanks. I'm, not, I'm gonna be very brief and sorry, I just went into cyberspace, I guess. Um, but uh, we, uh, I'm gonna just kind of take it towards uh, the end of my presentation in case it happens again. Um, so in 2015, we embarked on a five and a half million dollar capital campaign to finish the restoration of the building. And um, I'm very grateful to say that we were able to do that in two years. We raised the money and we did it through individual donations, uh, corporate donations, um, state and federal grant money, as well as historical tax credits. Um, and they were a big part of that. We were very, very fortunate to have a preservation architect that we work with who was uh, very well versed in talking to the state and the federal government about um, historic preservation as well as the tax credits. And uh, they really uh, helped us put it over the top. Uh, um, so UPH is now fully restored. Um, we kept as much of the historic nature of it as we possibly can, while also turning it into a state-of-the-art performing arts and community events venue right in the heart of Saratoga Springs. We actually ended up raising uh, almost $14 million to restore this building. And by my way of thinking, it's worth every penny of it because she's going to help Saratoga uh, go forward into the future in a very healthy way. 
We see UPH as an economic driver downtown. Uh, we're in the heart of town. We think it's great for the city. We think it's wonderful the county for the county. And it's also uh, wonderful for our region to have a beautiful historic location venue like this uh, that you can come to to see a show or to do an educational program or uh, get married or whatever there in a beautiful, beautiful setting. Uh, we also uh, worked, I just want to kind of say, historic tax credits are really important. They were very important to us. We had, um, uh, we hired a historic tax credit expert to see us through this. Uh, we were very fortunate to get a, a, a philanthropic corporation who was highly interested in buying our historic tax credits to help us uh, bring it home, so to speak. Um, and it's not for the faint of heart. It takes a lot of work to get these, but it's totally worth it in the end. So um, I, I, I will finish by saying uh, I am very grateful to the city of Saratoga and to all the donors and people who have supported this building through the years, because I, I truly feel, feel that is the linchpin that was missing in downtown Saratoga as a year round cultural center. And um, she is totally uh, worthy of having her future before us, our beautiful old gal UPH. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy, wonderful. Our uh, fourth speaker is John Shearer. John is uh, the town historian officially appointed for the town of Clifton Park. He's a graduate of the Cooperstown Graduate Program in History Museum Studies. Uh, his career was spent as a senior curator at the New York State Museum. He became town historian in 1979. That's a very long term, um, 41 years. And in 1992, he helped develop the historic preservation program of the town and in 1996, it's historic register. John? Uh, thank you, Field. <clears throat> I just want to point out that I was very young when I became town historian in 79. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in Clifton Park, we have about 10 buildings on the National Register, and we have one National Historic District, the Fisher Ferry Historic District. And the Fisher Ferry General Store, the Jonesville General Store, and Smith's Grain and Feed Store in El Nora, all on the National Register, were restored using the historic tax credits. So we did use that. And the town in 1999 acquired a historic building, the Historic Groom's Tavern, um, which has been restored using grant funding because it's on the National Register. I believe we got about $80,000 towards the restoration of that building. So we have been taking advantage of some of these tools uh, that have been mentioned. Now in 1992, uh, we established a historic preservation commission for the town. And uh, we, uh, SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office, helped us to do this. We used their guidelines in setting it up. It's a 15 member commission. We have an architect, a realtor, you know, various uh, knowledgeable people uh, on the commission. And it was set up as an advisory commission. So we advised the planning board and the uh, town board. Uh, they make the decisions based on our recommendations. Um, so we started this in 92, and then we began a massive education program to lobby for historic preservation in Clifton Park. We did uh, historic house tours, which emphasized the our architectural styles of buildings. Uh, we had lectures on um, and again, the history of buildings and how to do a house history and et cetera. Uh, and we uh, did walking tours, uh, all sorts of things to educate the public and uh, get them to understand that this is something, preserving our historic buildings was something that 
helps make our neighborhood unique. Um, we were pretty successful in doing this. And in 1996, we established our own town register of historic places. It was taking a long time to work through the National Register program. So we decided to form our own uh, National Register. This is strictly uh, an honorary thing. We uh, currently have about 65 buildings on our town register of historic places. Uh, I know people might think that's uh, uh, something for Clifton Park because people don't realize that Clifton Park has as much history as we do have. Uh, we get a reputation for, for being uh, what you see when you get off at exit nine. But at any rate, uh, uh, these buildings are strictly honorary. And when a place is put on our register, uh, we uh, do a uh, presentation at a town board meeting and we present the owner with a plaque. Now, a program that was established some years after 96, the idea of one of our town supervisors was to apply the uh, uh, farm conservation program, easement program uh, to historic preservation. Uh, the farm conservation easement is if you agree to uh, non-development rights for acreage for a certain period of time, uh, you get uh, a tax break and it's the reduced assessed value of your, of your land. And so we did, we applied this. And so people who are on our historic register can apply for this historic tax easement. And uh, if you agree to abide by our historic preservation ordinance for a period, it's on a sliding scale, from a period of 15 to 25 years. And if you agree to the 25 years, you get the maximum uh, tax uh, easement, which is a reduction in your taxes. On, on, the, on the buildings, on the, uh, the historic home and barn or whatever else is uh, on the property. This could reduce your assessment almost in half if you go for the 25 year. Uh, but in return, the people who accept that easement have to abide by our historic zoning ordinance, uh, which indicates that any exterior changes to the building have to be approved by the town uh, with the recommendation of the Preservation Commission. So, uh, and this includes any additions or anything else that are uh, put onto the building. And so we work with, well, initially, people did not sign up for the easement because they didn't want to uh, abide by the uh, zoning ordinance. Uh, but it has since become quite popular. In fact, people are asking to have their historic building put on the register so they can apply for the easement. Right now, of the 65 buildings on our register, half of them have the easement. And so the building department flags it when any work is being done on the exterior and it comes to the commission uh, for uh, approvement. Now, we like to be able to work with the owners of historic structures and try to work out a, a compromise if there's a problem or tell them what's available in terms of, uh, you know, creating uh, copies of moldings and, uh, uh, other, other ways that things can be done to preserve the exterior character of the home. And because of this, we also, we have an annual uh, preservation program where we have people who, you know, have historic paint colors. Uh, we invite Curtis Lumber, uh, other preservation people there to talk to people who own old homes and give them ideas as to uh, what they can do. 
We also have uh, an award ceremony once a year where we uh, present an award to uh, the, the best commercial restoration in town or the best residents. Uh, so we have two that we try to give. And uh, this has worked very well uh, because we present the award at a town board meeting. It gets covered by the press, et cetera. And uh, we use this uh, as a way of rewarding people as well. We have done fairly well as, as an advisory commission. We've worked with developers uh, in several cases uh, when they bought up an old farm in Clifton Park. Uh, we persuaded them to preserve the old farm and subdivide it from their lot. And we've been, we've been successful in having people buy the old house and restoring it. Uh, and the, we work with the planning board. In fact, we have a planning board member on the commission. We also have a uh, representation from the town council on our preservation commission. So we work very closely with them. And there's an awful lot that we've been able to do through working with the planning board. They have the power to make deals with developers and uh, it's, it's worked well. I mean, we've lost some battles, but we've, we've gained a lot of them as well. Um, we talked with a developer who was developing a, a subdivision in the historic hamlet of Jonesville. Uh, and you know how the new developments, they sort of build in around a cul-de-sac. And in this case, the, the rear yards of these buildings were gonna face Main Street Jonesville. We convinced the developer to turn his houses around to face the main street and use some Victorian bric-a-brac to, uh, to make it more compatible with existing structures. And he was delighted because he got one more building lot out of it. We've had another builder. We got him to subdivide a historic, a historic farmhouse from the property that was part of the deal made with the planning board. And the house did not sell because they wanted too much money for it and it needed a lot of work. But they uh, managed to, the, the planning board managed to give the builder a couple more building lots in that subdivision if they would reduce the price of the house, which they did. And someone bought it and it's now quite a show place. It's been on a number of house tours. Uh, the fire department, when they built an addition on their house, on their, on their building, it's an eyesore, it was an eyesore in Fisher Fair. It's right in the middle of the historic district and just didn't blend. Well, the, the uh, commission didn't like the plans for the, for the new addition. And we met with the, uh, the fire commissioners. And uh, of course they resented the fact that we were trying to tell them uh, what to do with their new addition. But they had the plans and uh, it was three bay, a three bay firehouse and uh, had a flat roof. So our architect on the commission put a gable roof on it. And then the three separations for the bays almost looked like a Greek temple. We put on some uh, freeze windows on the side. Anyway, it, it blends in great. They went for it. And of course, the following year, we gave them the town's preservation award. So that's just a little something that we're doing uh, in Clifton Park. Field. Thank you, John. Uh, we are open to questions, which you can enter on the Facebook uh, page. Uh, we have uh, three so far. Uh, perhaps one is a comment. Um, one listener says, that sounds like a really great program. Makes a heck of a lot of sense to me. Uh, I think he's referring to the Clifton Park program, but I'm not certain. Um, another listener says, once we lose these buildings, we cannot get them back again, but we probably can't keep all of them. How do we choose? Who would like to take a crack at that? Samantha? <laughs> um, well, I, I think there is a 
several different variables that come into determining uh, what buildings or what resources are preserved over and and it really can be uh, based on cultural history. It can be based on architectural significance. Uh, there are all these. There's just different factors. They it can be determined um, by whether or not maybe a building might seem very simple and the term vernacular. Um, a simple building, but is part of a larger sort of story. It's part like individually, they may not be significant, but as, as a as a a grouping, they have significance. Um, oftentimes, you know, it's people coming forward to share the history of a building that helps bring its significance. Um, sometimes it's just it takes people speaking up about that history to, to know whether or not it needs to be preserved. So I think there's lots of different ways to approach pre preservation, but I think there is more that the preservation movement can do and is doing to recognize different histories, whether that be the LBG, LBGTQ or women's history or African-American history. There's, there's many many ways that preservation is important and where I think the movement is is becoming broader and more inclusive and and I think it takes people becoming involved to help tell those stories. A field. Yes. Uh, we use the State Historic Preservation Office's criteria uh, when we look at buildings so they have to have a certain amount of integrity and what Samantha said was true. I mean, you, uh, you used you, architectural criteria can be one criteria. Uh, it's association with someone who was important to the community, uh, maybe something else, or uh, perhaps it was uh, involved in the uh, social or civic uh, atmosphere of the community, you know, like churches and things like that. But as I say, we, we just sort of adhere by what SHPO uses. Sure. Um, our next question is a corollary to the last one and uh, what Sam has just said. Um, and it reads, sorry, I'm using a loop on a, a <laughs> cell phone to read the question. But who gets to decide whose quote story end quote gets preserved? Who would like to take a crack at that? Sam, back I, mean, there, I, I, I would say that it could be a grassroots effort. Um, oftentimes the neighborhood or people with a historic site will come forward uh, to bring that, that, that significance to a group. Um, it can be through survey work. It could be through the city. I, I don't think it's a small group of people that actually um, has a small role in that. But I do say that the pub, there is a public process through the city and through the state and through um, the federal government to help determine. And they have quite criteria that is pretty um, inclusive, actually. So I, I don't know if that answers that question. Um, the next question is, is a new one, and it is. I think for John, uh, John's going to be uh, a good one to answer this, Sam could as well. Are composite products simulating wood being allowed on these projects? Today's pine in the lumber yards will not hold up, and the price of cedar and mahogany has become prohibitive. John, would you like to say something about that from your perspective in Clifton Park. Right. Uh, we do not approve of uh, vinyl or, or artificial siding because that's one of the reasons we grant the easement because we realize that people who own historic buildings uh, ex have to expend more to maintain them. For example, painting them uh, uh, every so often. And now they have paints that will really hold up for quite a while. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we grant the easement. We tell them, you know, we don't approve of vinyl siding, but here you can get some money from the easement to, to maintain your 
your building. But John, what about fiber cement, hardy board, for example? I don't know. We've never encountered that. Samantha, could you address that, please? On um, historic buildings, uh, the design guidelines for the city uh, encourage replacement in kind. So that would be wood. New construction uh, can use cementitious um, products, but uh, vinyl is not encouraged at all. Yep. And don't forget those pesky oval etched glass doors. Right. <laughs> My I mean, I think, noir. I think preservation is about being authentic. And so, um, and often you, you rarely have to replace a whole, all, every piece of wood on like on the siding of a, of a house or replace all your windows at once. They don't, they don't all need, fall into disrepair at one time. So if you, if people are maintaining their buildings, typically, you won't have to replace everything at once, which, you know, could, you can do it over time. Uh, we have a question for Teddy. Will UPS be able to open with social distance anytime soon? Well, I wish the answer to that question was yes, but unfortunately it's not yes. Um, we don't know when we're going to be able to open for music shows again. Um, our best guess would be um, next summer. Um, we don't have any guidelines from the governor on that yet. And also we are concerned that um, people wouldn't be comfortable coming inside. Uh, but to that point, um, I will tell you we have been open because we've uh, become an exhibit hall this summer, we had a, an exhibit in the hall that was very family friendly. It was from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and this is its last week. And one thing I can tell you is UPH, uh, thanks to the state of the art HVAC system that was installed in this historic building, we um, have the MERV 13 air filters and our HVAC system also has the ability to provide a blend with fresh air. So we're running it or 35 to 40% fresh air mix. So it's a really, uh, it's, it's a good environment to be in if you're inside. So uh, really grateful for that. Check, check out the um, pinball exhibit. It's a ton of fun and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So um, be sure to check it out before it goes. It's, it's uh, with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and there's some great memorabilia and uh, I think it for you're doing the best that you can and it's a great exhibit and a lot of fun. Well thank you Sam and this is the beauty of UPH it's a very this building uh, not only feels good and looks good but it has the ability to adapt to all kinds of circumstances and uh, I'm really grateful that we are in exhibit hall right now. <laughs> well and that's the beauty of, of preservation is adaptive reuse I mean, there are so many great um, examples of adaptive reuse within our own community with other, even other church buildings um, that are condos, uh, the Stone Abbey, and uh, there's just, uh, and, and throughout the region, um, you're seeing some really creative adaptive reuse, and hopefully we will see that, uh, like with Victoria Mills, hopefully in Schuylerville, or that it's supposed to take advantage of the tax credits, and um, so and Cohoes. I mean, there's just been some really amazing projects that are done with adaptive reuse because our buildings can do that. Our historic buildings can do that. Do any of our panelists have any closing remarks for us? Anyone at all? Um, I will say that preservation doesn't just happen. It happens because people become invested and are a part of it. And it takes not only voices, but it takes people who are willing to invest money. Unfortunately, there isn't this large pot of money that we can give away to help people to do it. I mean, there's some funding and, and my organization will certainly help people find grants and assist with tax credits, but it's important to be involved. And you know, you can't preserve your history if you, if you don't speak up. 
And so I encourage people to participate and explore how you can preserve your own community. It's important. The stories that buildings tell and resources tell, you can't, they're irreplaceable. And once they're lost, they're lost forever. And oftentimes those stories are lost with them. So beautifully said, thank you. Uh, and thanks to all our panelists, Samantha Bossart, Teddy Foster, Carrie Werner, John Shearer. And a special thanks to our underwriter, Schrader and Company of Burnt Hills. Uh, we're deeply grateful for their uh, confidence in us and their support of this program. Uh, also, thanks to Dr. Michael Landis, who uh, organized the program for this evening. On behalf of the Saratoga County History Center, thank you all for taking part in our Experts Next Door seminar on historic preservation. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.